Thank you, uh, Konstantin Steinberg, for your efforts, and thank you to the Institute for hosting us today. Finally, um, my little talk will be in English only. Um, a long time ago, when I, when I was young, I attended a, um, a school which is called United World College of the Atlantic. And um, the motto of that school, and as a matter of fact of the entire United World Colleges movement, which counts today about 17 colleges around the world, is um, a, a dictum, a sentence by um, the Canadian diplomat and politician and also Nobel Prize winner, Lester B. Pearson. And that um, dictum goes as follows, how can there be peace without people understanding each other? And how can this be if they don't know each other? So as you can see very easily, uh, this contains a kind of rationale for cultural diplomacy because it says no peace without understanding, no understanding without knowledge, therefore no peace without knowledge. Hence, we need to foster mutual knowledge of people. I've always found that um, I could in general um, agree with this, um, with this dictum and with what it implies, and yet I've always felt that um, in, in a sense it didn't sound entirely compelling to me in the sense that my understanding of it um, did not show it to me in a full compellingness um, and maybe in the full truth that it had and that there was something lacking, probably my understanding, for me to be able to understand it thoroughly. So what I would like to do today with you briefly is trying with the tools of philosophy to see if that same sentence can maybe understood in a deeper or true or more compelling sense than what its obvious first-hand um, meaning seems to suggest. Well, the first thing we can say um, with the tools of philosophy is that we can rule out that this um, dictum implies an instrumental uh, relation between um, culture and peace. Because this, one could understand it in this way. Uh, one could understand that it suggests, or at least admits, that one uses culture for the purpose of um, establishing or securing peace. Now, <clears throat> if we understand culture, and uh, Cicero was mentioned before uh, by my colleague, if we understand culture as the self-cultivation of humanity, so the fact of cultivating the humanity of man, then Culture is a kind of end which falls und under Kant's categorical imperative, which says, act in such a way uh, that you treat humanity in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always also as an end. So if culture is such an end, it cannot be treated merely as a means, and that means that Cultural diplomacy, even when it perhaps implies that culture can be a means, it can never take it merely as a means, or in other words, it implies that cultural diplomacy must, if it, if it is to deserve its name, um, be cultural in itself. It must be a cultural action in itself. It must have the quality of a cultural action in the sense that I just said. It must be must contain an element of the cultivation of the humanity of man. Now, just what, what does cultural action mean? Well, in, in our tradition, meaning in the Western tradition now, the foundational cultural action, the one that also gives the measure and the sense to all other cultural actions, is the action of philosophy, it is philosophizing. So the fundamental or foundational form of, this, of the cultivation of the humanity of man is philosophizing, the exercise of philosophizing. One way of understanding this exercise of philosophizing, a very old one, is that of self-knowledge, of knowing oneself. There is an old maxim, Delphic maxims, written on a temple, on a temple of Apollo in Greece, which says precisely this, gnoti sauton, 
know thyself. It is a, it's an imperative. We find other examples or other sayings in, in, uh, in the Greek tradition which go in the same direction. For instance, a very short uh, fragment by Heraclitus, 6th century BC, Heraclitus of Ephesus, that just says, Edicesamen hemauton. That is to say, I inquired into myself, or one could go a little bit further and say, I have known my, my own self to the very end of it, or I've known myself in my very end, hmm? or to the end. Now, this imperative, know thyself, is not imperative that has its origin in man himself. It responds to a need, or it, it is the result of a need which lies, in a sense, outside of man. And this need I would like to call an ethical need. So the imperative of self-knowledge comes from what I would like to call an ethical need. Now, what is an ethical need? And here I uh, have to ask you to bear with me, because now, uh, we have to look at a thing in, in, a, in a philosophical way, that is to say with the sometimes off-putting simplicity of philosophy. We need to say briefly what ethos means. And ethos, apart from being the um, dimension of human dwelling, in, well, the dimension in which man exists with his ways, in a different and a bit more rigorous sense, we can say the following. We say that the ethos is the dimension in which everything, all there is, attempts or hopes to be itself. I say again, ethos is the dimension in which the human being exists, in which all there is, everything, attempts or hopes to be itself. This means that being oneself is not a given for things. Now, the ethos can turn into a dimension in which everything has the time and space to be itself. It can turn into that dimension. It is not just, as a matter of fact, that dimension. Now, the ethos can turn into that dimension thanks to something which again, is not a thing that is part of the ethos or that is within the ethos, but thanks to something which philosophers have always um, inquired as a first principle, as a source, as a source which philosophers say, Greek philosophers say, withdraws or absconds in its own space and time, but precisely in doing that, it provides the time and space for everything to be itself. Now this principle, which has the might, so to speak, of turning the ethos into this dimension, this principle, Heraclitus, for instance, calls it the Sophon, it has itself a need. It is in need. And the need that it has is that of being acknowledged and owned and founded by man. So no turning of the ethos into the dimension in which everything has the time and space to be itself, without the acknowledgement and owning of man of this principle. Now, insofar as man acknowledges and owns and grounds this principle, man precisely finds his own self, or is himself. Man is the one being that is himself in this acknowledgement, which distinguishes him from other beings, as well as animals, and also it distinguishes him from gods. So we find that the, the imperative of self-knowledge, of knowing oneself, has its ground in what we can now call and this, the ethical need in the sense of the, the need of this, of this principle to be acknowledged, which man encounters within his ethos and which has this kind of um, consequence on ethos which are described as a turning. Now, when does this become interesting for cultural diplomacy? Well, in the moment in which we recognize that uh, 
the attempt of attaining a knowledge of oneself in response to the ethical need implies intrinsically the need of, the di of a dialogue with other attempts at self-knowledge in response to this ethical need. And this has been, for the Greeks not so much, uh, because they were the founders in a sense, so we, find, we don't find that element in the Greeks. But for, for all subsequent attempts at attaining a self-knowledge in the tradition of what, what was kicked off, to speak, by the, by the Greeks, there has been, in a very also obvious sense, this need, mm, the, the need within this, re this attempt at self-knowledge to enter into a dialogue with, we can say, other cultures within the philosophical culture now we are saying. Mm. For instance, the need of, um, of, of, a, of a dialogue with the Greek tradition and then with the Latin tradition and then also for Germans with the French tradition and so on. So the two, the, the, these two needs were strictly and intrinsically um, tied. And yet, one must say, and there I refer to something which was said uh, this morning, there has always been a, a restriction, first of all, in the scope of this um, journey of self-knowledge within the philosophical tradition, and corresponding to this restriction also a limitation in the scope I, should, I, want, I would like to say of the, the kind of the dialogue with other cultures, now cultures always intended as, again, attempts to, um, to know oneself. And this restriction has, I think, that's a thesis or a, something which I just put to you as something to, we might want to think about because it's an important problem. Where does this restriction come from? Now, I'm not going to say where the restriction comes from, the, um, but things, in a sense, begin to change in the moment in which it, uh, it becomes clearer that this journey of self-knowledge is a journey that l leads through language and requires us to go to the limit each time of our language and, and maybe beyond the limit of our language into what we can describe as the source of our language, which is not itself a language. We do, it's enigmatic what it is, but it's, it, it is not just the single language and perhaps the source of all languages. Uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt was mentioned this morning, who is a, an important figure in this respect. But be that as it may, um, with, the, with the increase of the, of the awareness of the element of language as the, the very element of thinking, mm -hmm. the, as the philosophical element, also the urgency of the, of the dialogue for, in, in the first place with the, with the Greek source, but then also with other, other sources mm -hmm. and with neighbors who are in, engaged in the same attempt becomes bigger. In 1942, um, in, a, in a lecture course on Hölderlin, Martin Heidegger says the following, a historical people or a people of the philosophical tradition is, in italics, meaning is itself only from the dialogue with, of its own language with foreign languages. Hmm? A, a, a historical people is, is it, can be itself only from or thanks to the dialogue of its own language with foreign language, languages. And something like that hadn't been said before. Mm -hmm. So there we are in the middle, in the first half of the, of the 20th century. In other words, the, the, the imperative of self-knowledge, knowing oneself as an answer to the ethical need, implies, has a, as an implication, mm -hmm as something that cannot be renounced as a necessary implication, what we can call a need of translation, because the colloquy of languages is translation. So there is a need of translation inscribed, inbuilt, in, within our answer to this ethical need. And translation here does not mean substituting 
the, the words of one language with the words or with equivalent, mm, presumably equivalent words of another language. Quite the contrary. As a matter of fact, this translation, which comes from a need, which is not just out of interest mm, or something occasional, but this translation, which is itself a need, knows of the essential untranslatability, the reciprocal untranslatability of languages, meaning that each language is a unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable answer to the ethical need. And only when we, ha when we have an awareness of untranslatability, then translating becomes really interesting. Hmm? And we, can, and we, 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 we feel the urgency of, of translating. So translation means entering a dialogue with the other, and again, this means in the first place within our own tradition, but then, once we are ready, clearly also with other traditions, it means entering a dialogue with the other where, where the other is at the highest hmm, of his or that culture of its attempt of self-knowledge, at the culminating point of that quest or of that search. And this brings us far off this kind of entering, this risking, I should want to say, risking the kind of dialogue with that kind of world of our Greek tradition, of the Latin tradition, and so on, br br brings us very, very far off from where we are. And each time forces us to learn a new, our own language, a, a new from that source which is not our language itself, but which we must presume that we share with other languages. Hmm? So the need of translation as a need ever again to learn our own language as a way of responding to the ethical need. And in this way, the kind of um, mutual knowledge and, and the kind of mutual uh, understanding that arises from this kind of exercise is well, at least we can say more compelling, because at least it is as compelling as it gets, mm -hmm. and it, uh, because it is, it is a need. It is a need that comes from, from what um, sets us on the path towards self-knowledge. Now, from this we cannot uh, certainly derive um, directives for, um, for cultural diplomacy, But the awareness of this kind of knowledge of the other and of this kind of motivation of source, of need that drives us towards a dialogue with the other and, dri and results in what I would like to call an ethical knowledge of the other, as opposed to knowledge of the other being a, a mere exchange of information, as opposed to knowledge of the other being merely some more or less empathic understanding, explanation, or justification of other ways of life, which are fine, which are fine and, and necessary, but are in a sense, if I may say so, superficial. So this kind of um, awareness of being compelled to this dialogue out of our own need of knowing ourselves can perhaps serve as a, as a source that can inspire a style or a taste in cultural diplomacy. A style in the sense, well, in a sense that maybe we can sum up in the, in the formula, be strong of your need and rich of your poverty strong of your need and rich of your poverty. Uh, meaning that cultural diplomacy, if it is at all aware of what is at stake in, uh, in the encounter with other cultures in this fundamental sense that I've tried to outline, it will, I think, refrain from just presenting uh, a culture in a triumphant way or as a story of successes. It will present it at the highest of its own need of translation, its own need of 
dialogue. So it will bring to the to the gathering, hmm, to the place where to the place of encounter, its its deepest attempts of knowing itself, of, of the deepest attempts of its culture of knowing itself, which coincide with the points where the need of dialogue is the highest. So where we are richest in, our, in what is in our culture, we are poorest. So the cultural diplomacy, therefore, that is in a way introduced to this uh, dimension uh, of the foundation of sense, will, um, I think, present, um, because I, I take the word from this morning's presentation, uh, the ambassador's presentation, present itself with uh, this kind of style, which is also the one that um, is the most inviting for others to, and not only the most inviting for others to enter a dialogue with us, but also the one in which we show, we tr truly show what we have in the sense of another one seeing, well, they are doing that in order to know themselves, and what about us? Hmm? So this, this kind of invitation, hmm? and this kind of, I would like to say, of, of, um, a, um, is a, a, a dialogue which is once again rooted in a need and not just something occasional. And also not just a dialogue that has as its motive an, an exterior uh, reason, a contingent reason. Now, as far as taste is concerned, well, there again, what is a cultural uh, diplomacy without taste? Uh, taste just <coughs> implies that we know that um, what is to be presented is not indifferent or indiscriminate or arbitrary. That it is the, the, the thinkers or those who are engaged in this, um, in this self-knowledge which brings with itself the need of a dialogue, who set the agenda of, 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 of the dialogue itself. It is not, it, the presentation it cannot be a presentation of whatever because it happens to take place in a country. Where the needs lie, which dialogue, at what time, with whom, in what respect, all of this comes from that um, original need or from, from, from those points within our culture in which the quest for knowing ourselves is going on. They, th those rare, strange human beings know what is needed and which kind of dialogue is necessary, at what moment, and with whom, and so on. So, and that taste is not a taste we, we can just build um, in, in abstraction from these, from these matters. Now, just let me, to, to conclude, close the circle, uh, maybe, with um, Lester Pearson's um, dictum. How can we close the circle? Well, the easiest way is that we try to say something about the one word that we haven't touched so far, namely the word peace. And we, we haven't, we haven't explicitly, but we have already given, I think, what can count as a, as a way, one way, of um, defining what, uh, what peace might be. If we just think back to the moment when I was talking about the ethos, and I said the ethos can turn into a dimension in which everything has the time and space to be itself. Now, I think a, a situation, uh, an instant, an instant in which everything has the time and space to be itself deserves to be called an instant of peace, irrespectively of whatever outer circumstances um, are in place. And so if we take the word peace in this sense, then Lester Pearson's uh, dictum makes a lot of sense. He said, how, can, how can we ever get to having our ethos turned into a dimension in which everything has the time and space to be itself if there is not an, an ethical understanding, an ethical understanding of people and how can we get to this understanding without 
a knowledge of each other, but a knowledge of each other's ways of responding, of answering the ethical need. And so we can, I think to conclude, just restate the, this dictum, which can stay as it is in a sense, but perhaps we can just add um, in the end, in brackets, a little note just to remind us of the way that brought us to this um, perhaps richer understanding of that, of that dictum. So we can say, how can there be peace without people understanding each other? And how can this be if they don't know each other? But how can that be if they do not, in the first place, set out to know themselves? Thank you for listening. Thank you.